Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 20th meeting of 2019. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. So the first item on the agenda is for the committee to decide whether to take item three on today's agenda and consideration of all future evidence on our marine inquiry in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And second item on our agenda this morning is to hear evidence as part of our marine inquiry. This morning we'll hear from two panels. The first of our panel will focus on the current health of Scotland's marine environment. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Katie Gillam, the team manager for marine ecosystems for the Scottish National Heritage. Good morning. Uh, Professor John Baxter, um, who's appearing in a personal capacity. And uh, Professor Michael Brothers from the Scottish Association for Marine Science. Good morning to you all. Um, I want to start by talking about good environmental status. Um, can I ask you all to give your views on what progress has been made towards achieving good environmental status in Scotland's marine environment? Katie, you want to go first? <laughs> um, so there's a consultation out at the moment which gives an overview of um, where um, the UK thinks it's got to in terms of achieving good environmental status. Um, and you've probably already seen that, so I won't go into lots of detail on it. Um, but there are some key points from that. Um, essentially, um, you know, the, the consensus is that we haven't yet achieved good environmental status for all the things that we're looking at. There are some things that we have done better than others on. So, for example, on the water quality side of things, looking at contaminants, that kind of thing, then we are um, looking at uh, achieving good environmental status. Um, but there are other areas where there are um, big areas of uncertainty. Um, so, for example, if we look at whales, dolphins, porpoises, um, if we look at underwater noise, um, we're still at the stage where we're trying to actually collect enough data and develop the assessment methodologies to enable us to draw those kind of conclusions. Um, and I think it's also fair to say there's some areas where we're saying we're not meeting uh, the targets at the moment. So, um, areas like seabirds, for example, we're not meeting good environmental status and that's um, you know that's been uh, put quite clearly in the consultation paper yeah, yeah. Else? Um, I, I, I would agree with uh, what Katie has said uh, I mean it is a big challenge to to actually establish whether we are meeting uh, good environmental status um, and there are other areas that uh, Katie hasn't mentioned that you know we clearly aren't particularly things like uh, seals or harbor seals in particular which are, are showing significant declines. I think one of the biggest areas of challenge is the, is the benthos, the, the seabed habitats. Uh, the amount of data that we have uh, on many of those is, is, is limited. Um, I mean, the challenges of recording and surveying the marine environment are, are huge. We're getting better at it, but it's extremely expensive and, and, and very challenging. So I think there are certainly areas where, where we still need to, to gather more data. Um, there is also, of course, as I'm sure you're, you're aware, the, the, the work that's going on uh, in relation to revising the, the Scottish Marine Atlas that was published about a decade ago now. Um, and uh, that work is ongoing at the moment uh, in terms of uh, further assessments of all the different features of Scotland's marine environment. Um, we would hope that uh, that work will be completed sometime uh, next year, but at the moment there isn't a, a final date for that. Um, yeah, so um, as an ecologist, my primary interest is, is in how many, what the abundance of marine organisms are, is, and defining good environmental status requires us to understand how how, a, how the abundance of those species relates to what you would normally expect for, for uh, an environment that was in, in good condition. And that definition is very difficult where you have um, environments and, and populations that may already be degraded in some way. You've got a, a shifting baseline, in fact. Um, so whether we can say we've achieved good environmental status or not is still an area of question. Um, uh, and the other main issue is that with climate change, those baselines are going to continue to shift irrespective of whatever um, efforts we make to try and protect our own environment. Um, so um, as it's a, an area of active research for, for, for me to try to kind of get a, a better handle on how to um, come up with objective criteria for saying we've, we've, we've achieved those, those, um, that, that status. 
So a couple of you have mentioned data, and there's gaps. There's gaps in that data. Can you maybe outline you know, where, where those gaps are and, 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 and how they might be addressed? Well, I think I, I mentioned data to begin with, uh, mm. so uh, I'll, I'll take that one first. And uh, um, it, I, I think, yeah, it, th there's lots of gaps, if you like, and, and uh, scientists always say that they don't know enough and we need to know more. And I think it's important that we don't get uh, trapped into that way of thinking and don't do anything uh, until we know more. We know a lot. Uh, and we should we should act on what we know. But the main areas I think where where we're still lacking data are just in simple things like the, the distribution and extent extent of many of the certainly the benthic habitats uh, in in Scottish waters. You know, there's been a lot of work done over recent years in in mapping and the techniques uh, allowing us to to map the seabed. Uh, are improving all the time, but it's a huge area that we are trying to cover, um, and uh, you know there are huge gaps. So uh, you know, uh, um, employing uh, the most efficient ways of, of gathering those data, I think, is really important. Uh, I think we also need to. Um, there's probably a lot more data out there than we, we're, we're aware of, and we need to mine. Uh, other sources of data, industry, uh, etc., have have data. They're getting better at sharing those data, uh -huh. but you know there is there is still gaps there. But yeah, I, that, that's I, what I was going to ask. I mean, because obviously there's a lot of people, in different sectors operating in the marine environment, and they're all going to have their own sources of data. It's just a case of you know coming together and realizing that it's the environment that you all share. Yeah. So therefore, I, I, exactly, and, uh -huh. and and that is that is where we really need to, um, you know, there needs to be greater effort in, in bringing people together. It is getting better, mm. undoubtedly getting better. Um, I'm long enough in the tooth to remember times when you know it, it just wasn't shared. Uh, it just you know, different people had their data, and that was it. Um, I think the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other area where. We need greater understanding. Is is, is one that uh, uh, Mike mentioned, and that's in, in relation to climate change and all the, the different factors. Um, we need to we need to get better understanding of what um, sea temperature rise is going to mean for for many of the organisms in in, the, in Scottish waters. Uh, and the focus has largely up to now been on temperature, um, but we mustn't ignore the other major drivers that are, are coming along. Ocean acidification um, is, is an issue which is becoming a greater issue around the world. At the moment, Scotland is fairly um, um, free of, of that, but it, it is coming our way. Uh, and the other one, which I think um, is really still very much left field, but is, is a great concern, is ocean deoxygenation. Uh, where we're, we're getting huge dead zones appearing. Not in Scottish waters at the moment, but there is the potential for those in some of our deeper sea lochs and in some of the more offshore areas of Scotland. And that will uh, be very detrimental mm. to all life uh, in, in, in the ocean. And have the causes of that been identified? Or the causes of it? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, uh, as the sea warms up, it's able to hold less oxygen, um, you know, the, the warmer the water, the less oxygen, mm. uh, less gases that can be held in the water. So uh, as, as the oceans warm, you get uh, less, less uh, oxygen in the water. Uh, eutrophication and pollution uh, also causes extensive um, dead zones. Uh, there was something on the, on the, on the uh, television uh, just yesterday, I think, uh, uh, reporting on a huge uh, deoxygenated zone um, in the Red Sea, which is a result of uh, runoff from uh, um, uh, countries around there, fertiliser runoff, okay. which has created eutrophic uh, uh, situations. So we, we understand the physics and the chemistry. We don't really yet fully understand the biological implications. Right. Stuart. Sure. Um, to opening up a huge debate, um, we've identified that there are significant gaps in our data. 
although I'm not sure that we know which of those matter most. But I just wondered, given that we've got about a quarter of Europe sees, how our neighbours are doing in terms of the data that, that they are relying on and they have. And, and it, just a subjective high-level answer is perhaps it, what we're doing, because are we doing better or worse than our neighbours? Shall I have a go at that one first of all? <laughs> um, I, I, um, I think we're in a relatively good position compared to other countries across Europe, and, and that really reflects um, the importance that we place on our seas, culturally, economically, socially, in all sorts of ways. Uh, they're of great importance. Um, so, for example, um, you know, there's, there's programmes of work going on across uh, Europe looking at um, identifying bycatch um, and looking at the issues around that. And whilst we would say that there are still gaps in our data in Scotland in understanding bycatch and what it means for dolphins and, and porpoises and, and whales, um, actually we have we have a monitoring program that's in place that covers the UK um, and we uh, you know have something that's more comprehensive than than in other countries um, I guess um, in in some areas though uh, I think one of the important things to emphasise is that we're, we're trying to collaborate at that sort of much broader scale. Um, and so the OSPAR convention becomes really important with the work that we're doing through that. Um, and so there, there is a lot of information that's being collected by other countries. Um, and part of the work that has come through the Marine Strategy Framework Directive has placed more emphasis on working collaboratively through those regional seas conventions. Um, and over the last few years, developing a series of common indicators um, so that we can pull the data from from different countries and start to actually make assessments at a broader scale. And I think that's really important in the marine environment because the scale at which the issues occur and the scale at which the management response is needed um, you know, is often broader than, than at the Scottish scale. It might be at the scale across Europe or across the Northeast Atlantic. Um, so we are getting um, better at referring to what you were saying earlier about actually collaborating with, with uh, different organisations. Um, but I think we are in a relatively uh, good uh, position compared to some other countries in terms of the data that we have. So I, I think I would agree with that broadly in terms of when we're talking about fish and birds and marine mammals, but for other habitats, I don't think we do quite as well as, as other countries. In, in my mind, I was perhaps more thinking about static, you know, metal beds, uh, corals, our understanding of that, rather than mobile parts of the biology of the seas, where inevitably we share. Um, so I, I do know that, that Norway, for example, is, is interested in its kelp forests and, and does, does an awful lot of research into kind of the extent and, and how the status of those forests are changing over time. We, we managed to map ours, well, at least get a good, some good survey data from them back in the 1990s. But it's fair to say that activity, that level of activities hasn't continued at, at the par with what's going on elsewhere. So we may well be doing OK for, for some parts of the, the ecosystem, but uh, I don't think we are in others. I, I, think, I think it's actually where the interest lies with individual researchers. That's where the focus will be. And, and you know, as, as has been said, there are some, some, some um, habitats where there, is, there has been a lot of work uh, done um, in, in recent years. Um, on, on those specific habitats. You, you mentioned merle. I mean, you, you know, there's a lot of work being done on merle beds, um, uh, the, the biology of merle beds. We still don't know where all the merle beds are uh, because, you know, you can't go out and just sort of stick your finger in the air and that's where, you know, tell you where they are. Th there's work going on to try and help us to um, at least model where some of these habitats might be which would possibly help us focus our, our survey work in the future so that we, we can go and check whether where the models say things are, they should be. Um, the, the, the other area where I think we are very, um, very well um, uh, served is the UK, Scotland, uh, has um, a great history of marine research. So we actually have probably a better historical record of some of our habitats, uh, you know, where we know that they're there, we, we've, they've been studied for a long time. So we're in a good position to, to actually make some sort of assessment on how, how things have changed in specific areas over a longer period than maybe many of our, our, our European uh, uh, neighbours.
Could I just maybe add something on the Benthic side of things, if that was particularly what your, your interest was in? I think um, there's a question of scale in there as well. So I think if you're looking at a very broad distribution of where the sediments and where the rocky habitats are, then we have very good information on that. And we can use a combination of the actual data and the predictions to, to give broad distribution maps across our seas. Um, I think if you're then wanting to look at a finer scale, the information that's, um, uh, I guess, most comprehensive is probably within the marine protected areas for those benthic habitats and particularly for things like you mentioned, what we call the biogenic habitats, which is where the, the plant or the animal is actually creating the structure, so things like mole beds and horse muscle beds. So the information that we have within the MPA network um, you know, is getting much better. Um, it, it, it gets older and, and kind of, um, uh, I guess, there's fewer data points outside the MPA network, but that, that is something that we're looking to try and address. Kavina, good morning to the panel. I could ask you specifically, um, you'll be aware that um, both our own committee and the RAC committee have um, been scrutinising the, um, uh, the way forward for the aquaculture in industry at the moment. And I'm just wondering in terms of um, uh, research that's being done about the effects of, of that industry uh, on the seabed specifically, but the wider marine environment, if you can um, draw any attention to either the um, the research or indeed the gaps uh, in uh, just briefly as we have a short amount of time okay sorry. <laughs> okay um, at sam's we've had um, um, an effort to model the the settlement of, of kind of fish farm waste effectively kind of fish feces and excess food onto the onto the onto the seabed itself because that additional load of organic material is what what the real problem is underneath fish farms um, and so this the model that we developed is called Deeper Mod. Um, it's in use by SEPA at the moment to try to establish what sort of footprint um, one should consider when it comes to, to looking at the seabed itself. So um, it's pretty well understood how the, the, the seabed organisms respond to that additional load of organic nutrients fr from one end of the scale almost completely without life, they'll just be with no oxygen, um, a layer of bluish um, kind of bacteria on the sediment surface, through to um, species which can tolerate low oxygen, then uh, at the other end of the scale, a perfectly undamaged uh, environment. And that, that response is, is well enough understood to allow us to, to kind of regulate how long a fish farm should be in a certain place, how much, how, what the stocking density of that that those fish might be. And yeah, I mean, I think that's a useful piece of science it does help us with, with that kind of regulatory process. What's probably less well known is how many fish farms you can put in a larger area and what the impact on that maybe sea lock might be. Are there particular challenges in getting sectors bought into the process of collecting data and understanding impacts? I'm thinking in particular about the impact of uh, noise on cetaceans. Um, you know, there's been a lot of controversy in the past around Ministry of Defence operations in the seas, but obviously there are, there are confidentiality issues there around understanding and assessing the impacts of naval operations on cetaceans. So I'm wondering if, there are, if that's an issue, if there are other sectors where getting access to that data and that buy-in is, is an issue. Uh, yeah, I'll start on that one. Um, so, um, yes, there have been discussions going on for a long time uh, with the uh, MOD just about all sorts of uh, different activities relating to noise, um, and there's a protocol that's established for uh, dealing with that. So there's a, a tool called the, the MESAT tool, um, and that's really a, a tool that helps to um, assess risk um, and to help understand what mitigation might need to be put in place for particular activities that um, the Navy in particular would want to, to undertake. Um, so I think there's been a, um, you know, a lot of progress and there's ongoing dialogue uh, in, uh, in, um, in looking at mitigation on that side of things. Um, I think for another example where there's been a lot of focus on, on underwater noise is related to the aquaculture industry with um, the use of acoustic deterrent devices. And again, there's a programme of work looking at that. Um, and I know that Marine Scotland have got uh, work ongoing at the moment to actually better understand um, you know, how many devices are being used and how frequently they're being used. Um, and that will help us to then get a better handle on um, you know, what the impact might be, what the risks might be, and, and, and then understand what, what management might need to be put in place after that. So there's, there's a couple of examples, but there's a lot of work underway. I mean, I, I would maybe just add to that, uh, I mean, one of the other areas where, you know, in, in recent years, 
the noise issue has been uh, has been uh, a significant one is in marine renewable energy developments and, and the piling uh, that goes on uh, when putting wind farms in particular into, into the sea um, and the noise um, that's generated uh, during those activities. Um, my experience in, uh, uh, is that you know this has been well managed and well regulated and that there has been you know an understanding by the industry that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, I don't know that we're quite at the point of fully understanding the um, the long term implications. Uh, you know whether animals, uh, particularly mobile species, are are, are you know, moved out of an area on a permanent basis or on a temporary basis. What that even if they're moved out on a temporary basis, which might be for a significant number of months, you know, what implications that has for their, their, their um, population. Uh, but, you know, there is work underway to, to better understand all of that. Uh, but it's, it's work in progress. So, more broadly, engaging developers in the marine environment with the collection of the appropriate data is really important. And one of the best examples I can think of in terms of that is, is the Shetland Oil Terminal Environmental Advisory Group, SOTIAG. They, when, when the proposal went in to put an oil terminal in Sulham Vaux they, in the mid-1970s, it was ensured that there was an environmental monitoring program put in place. And that joint activity with the, between the Sulvo Association and, and the operators of the oil terminals resulted in probably one of the best understood environments uh, around Scotland. There's a, there are a 40-year time series of, of how uh, the seabed and how the coast and how the birds in the area have changed. And we understand, probably it's probably the, one of the best examples of understanding the relative impacts of the, of the oil terminal and, and climate change. And... The advantage has been is in as, in as much as we can, we can see that most of the changes that have happened there have been because of climate change and not because of the operation of the oil terminal. Um, there's a huge advantage in, in engaging early with, with potential users of the marine environment in that regard. You know, there's no compunction on people operating in the marine environment to provide data, to share data, or to get involved with is that things that you just talked about? Um, Sullenvo isn't isn't a voluntary um, arrangement. I think I think the arrangement was put in place before the development of the oil terminal right. itself, and it's right. an ongoing the arrangement whereby the monitoring's funded. Um, but there's all sorts of potential other examples where a voluntary provision of data from uh, vessels could be could be really useful. Right. A good, another good example is uh, the continuous plankton recorder survey, which does cover some of Scottish waters, but it's it's a it's a basically a monitoring scheme where um, recording devices are put onto commercial ships, and the movement of commercial ships through the water is enough to sample the plankton. Um, it's I mean, important. Okay. That, that, that is another extremely long-term uh, data is. set, which is really important. One of the challenges with it at the moment is I don't think there's any. Um, lack of willingness of operators, shipping firms, to, to put these um, uh, um, uh, um, nets on, on, their, on their vessels. The challenge is finding the funding to actually analyse the data once it's been right. collected. Um, you know, and this is a uh, SAFOS, the uh, Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation for Ocean Science, which is the, the organisation that actually. Uh, analyzes these data, uh, you know, they're based down in Plymouth, but they do the whole of the UK, um, is, is stretched for, yeah. for the sources to, to actually analyze the data or the, analyze the samples yeah. to get the data um, that will uh, help us understand what's going on. Okay, John Scott. Um, thank you, convener. Um, can I just ask you, notwithstanding the gaps in the data, is the UK marine strategy an effective framework for assessing and delivering GES? Or does it need to be updated or revised? Or are you content with it, notwithstanding the shortcomings and the lack of success in, in various parts of it thus far? 
I'll go for that one as well then. Um, so um, I, th I think if you look um, over the time since the Marine Strategy Framework Directive has come into place, um, and, and that's what the UK Marine Strategy implements, then there's been a huge amount of progress there. So um, we have, as you said, notwithstanding the gaps, um, we have collected um, a lot more data and we have improved our understanding. Um, and I think the thing that's been really helpful through the, the Marine Strategy and, and the Directive more generally is, as I mentioned before, the joint work that we're doing through OSPAR, um, and that's allowed us to um, really focus in on developing new assessment techniques. So there's a series of new indicators that have, have been developed, um, which we're, we're using now, um, to, to really bring all of the existing data together to help us to, to understand what the impacts on the marine environment uh, are. So I, I think um, that's that's been useful. As we've said, we haven't actually got to the point where we've said we've, we've fully achieved good environmental status, um, and there's definitely Definitely further work to, to do there. Um, maybe if I could um, uh, give an example on the, the Benthic side of things. Um, so um, we had talked before about how the, there is, um, you know, uh, a variable amount of information that's available on the uh, seabed habitats and species. Um, and so far, we've made good progress on what's called a seafloor integrity um, indicator, um, and that's telling us kind of um, how much pressure there is on seabed habitats, um, and it also relates to the sensitivity of those habitats as well. So that, that's a really good step forward. Um, but one of the things that's set out in the current consultation is the intention to do further work to develop um, more indicators. Um, and I think that's really important because if you look at seabed habitats and species, um, they are a really good indicator of the health of our seas more generally. And that's because they stay in the same place. So they're really integrating all of the different pressures that exist on the marine environment. Um, and, and you see the results of that. So understanding uh, the implications for seabed habitats and species is, is, is really important. Um, so that, that commitment to develop further indicators and then to find a way of collating them all together to get an integrated assessment of the seabed, I think, is a, is a, is a good um, uh, you know, position to be in in terms of setting out a future direction. Mm -hmm. okay, could I move on to the OSPAR um, intermediate assessment and questions from Angus MacDonald? Okay, thanks, um, convener. Good morning to, to the panel. Yeah, just delving a wee bit deeper into the OSPAR uh, intermediate assessment uh, from 2017. Um, clearly, you know, there, there are a number of areas of concern. Uh, for example, marine birds, 20% uh, decline in the abundance compared to levels observed 25 years ago. Seabed habitats, you've just mentioned, uh, the OSPAR assessment uh, of physical disturbance from bottle, uh, bottom uh, trawling shows that 86% of the assessed areas in the Greater North Sea and the Celtic Seas are physically disturbed. Um, there's issues with marine mammals, marine litter, of course, and also contaminants. But some good news that I noticed was that uh, in some areas, fish communities are showing signs of, of recovery. So um, what can you, you tell the committee uh, that, that, that you know about past and present trends in seabird, marine mammal and fish populations? Um, I'll start. Oh, I can talk about the marine mammals, certainly. Uh, um, if, uh, seal, if we take the seals, we have two species of seals in, in the UK, um, the harbour seal and the grey seal. Um, if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, grey seals were almost uh, extinct from the UK. Um, it was estimated there was less than 500 animals left. This was largely due to hunting and uh, uh, both targeted hunting and, and just um, um, uh, fisheries control, basically. Um, we now have about 40% of the world's population of grey seals in Scottish waters, uh, about 120,000 animals. Uh, so um, the number of, of seals, uh, grey seals, um, has, has uh, increased dramatically as a result of um, uh, uh, legislation that's been put in place to control the, the hunting of seals. Um, uh, and, you know, that was initially through the, the Conservation of Seals Act and then more, uh, laterally through the Marine Scotland Act, which uh, provided even greater uh, measures of protection. 
the other reason why seals have, uh, grey seals in particular, have, have increased in numbers so much is, is because of the depopulation of many of the islands of Scotland uh, where, where uh, lighthouses became automated. Um, it only took one or two people on, a, on an island to dissuade the seals from going there to, to breed. Now that we've got so many islands which are not populated, have nobody living on them, uh, the seals are, are very grateful and have returned. The Monarch Isles on the west coast is, is a prime example. It's the largest grey seal breeding colony in, in eastern Atlantic. Um, uh, it happened since the, 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 uh, the lighthouse was automated. Um, so grey seals are doing well. Um, some might say they're doing too well, but uh, uh, grey seals are doing well. Harbour seals... Uh, which uh, um, are, are the smaller of the two species. Um, Scotland um, was uh, the stronghold in Europe for harbour seals. Uh, the numbers were, um, we have about 40,000 harbour seals in, in Scotland. Um, these are estimates, these are minimum estimates because they're very difficult to, to count. Um, uh, but what we're seeing is a very strange um, uh, phenomenon uh, with harbour seals in that on the east coast of Scotland and in the Northern Isles, the harbour seal numbers are declining dramatically. Um, Orkney, which was the stronghold for harbour seals, has seen about a 90% decline in its, its numbers in the last 12 years. The Firth of Tay um, has seen a 95% decline in its harbour seal numbers in the last 12 years. Uh, if you go further south, in, uh, uh, down to the Wash, which is another important area for harbour seals, they're doing very well. But it seems to be the northern, northeastern part of Scotland, which is where harbour seals are suffering uh, and declining. The west coast population is increasing. But we know that the, the seals from the east coast haven't gone to the west coast because we can tag them. Um, and there's also been genetics work done, which shows that there is very little exchange between the East Coast and the West Coast. So we know that something is happening to the harbour seals in the East and North East of Scotland. There's a huge amount of research that's going on at the moment, funded by Scottish Government, um, uh, carried out by the Sea Mammal Research Unit at St Andrews University to try and understand what is going on to see if there's anything that can be done about it. Uh, but at the moment, we don't have any concrete answers as to what the cause of these declines are. We've got some answers as to we now know what isn't causing the decline, if you see what I mean. So we, we know that... Um, for instance, um, uh, killer whale predation is not significant, so, so that's not an issue. Uh, we know that disease um, is not an issue. There has been no foci distemper outbreaks that, that have caused this. Uh, so we've been able to start ticking off what it isn't causing it, but we yet don't know what is causing it. Uh, but there is ongoing work. So... As far as harbor, uh, seals are concerned, one species is doing very well. The other one is doing well in places, but very badly in other places. Uh, in terms of cetaceans, um, by and large, um, our cetacean populations, as far as we know, and again, data, historical data are relatively limited, um, are doing quite well. Uh, and I guess the, the, the sort of the best example of this is with the bottlenose dolphin population on the east coast of Scotland. Uh, when, we when we were designating special areas of conservation, the focus was on the Murray Firth, and the Murray Firth is a special area of conservation for bottlenose dolphins. That's where we thought the population was. We now know that um, there's over 120 bottlenose dolphins regularly use the Firth of Tay, um, as, a, as a habitat, and there is some interchange with the Murray Firth, but not a, a huge amount. And we're now, in the last two or three years, getting increased reports that there are sightings almost on a daily basis of bottlenose dolphins in the Firth of Forth as well. Uh, so 
the, both their range is expanding, but also it would appear their numbers are, are increasing because we're not seeing a decline in numbers in the Murray Firth. We're seeing more dolphins in more places. Uh, so the bottlenose dolphin uh, story is probably a good news story. It well, definitely is a good news story. Um, but th those would be uh, the, the main the main sort of uh, points on, on, on cetaceans and, and marine mammals. Okay. Just say something on the, the fish and the bird side Please. of things. Yeah. So, um, it, uh, as you said, with the um, outcome from the OSPAR intermediate assessment, um, it, although the target hasn't been met in, in terms of fish populations, fish stocks, um, it's a positive story in that we're getting closer to meeting that target. And you can see a, a, a long-term uh, kind of improvement there, which is really welcome. Um, and, and going back to some of the earlier discussions that we were having about data sets, the quality of the data that we have on uh, commercial fish stocks is, is really excellent. And it's a very long-term time series and that, that supports management decisions, so, so that's really good. Um, I, I guess uh, one of the things to highlight as a kind of contrast to that is where we don't have good data is for the non-commercial uh, species um, and of particular uh, interest in terms of understanding how our ecosystem's functioning. Um, we're particularly lacking data on prey species um, as well, so the prey species that would be then um, relevant to seabirds and for marine mammals that will then help us to, if we have a better understanding of the prey species, we can then hopefully uh, better interpret the data on, on, on the seabirds and the marine mammals as well. Um, so so that's, that's briefly on the, the fish side of things. For the bird side of things, the um, uh, picture in Scotland is very similar to the, the picture that's shown by the OSPAR intermediate assessment. Um, and we have a seabird breeding uh, indicator. Um, and that measures broadly two things. It measures looking at the um, abundance of breeding birds. Um, and over the time period that that indicator has been running since the mid-1980s, for the 12 species that are recorded, um, there's been a, a, an overall decline in the number of, um, or the abundance of, of breeding seabirds. Um, although I think it's similar to the sort of seal situation that John was describing there in that overall decline hides a quite complex picture. So you have some seabirds that have declined much more significantly, some things like Arctic terns, things like Arctic skewers, um, but other birds where you've seen a, a, a really quite big increase. So uh, species such as, as gannets, which are um, kind of more, more generalists they can feed and uh, deeper diving um, it's really the the birds that tend to feed on sand eels that feed in shallower waters that are doing more poorly at the moment um, and the other aspect that, that we measure in, in relation to breeding seabirds is um, uh, the success of breeding, um, so the, the overall sort of productivity. Um, and again, that's measured since the 1980s, and we look at 12 uh, key species for that. Um, and that's a much more mixed picture. Um, and so you, you have a, uh, the indicator where the line is kind of going up and down, up and down in relation to the, the target. Um, so um, at the moment, um, uh, we're slightly below, uh, below the target, um, but... Uh, uh, yeah, as I say, it's, it's quite a mixed picture between the different species as well. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Forgive me. Um, I'm very concerned about what you said. Climate change is probably, we said, in Salem Vaux, the biggest influence in the change is there. And I kind of suspect that climate change is probably the biggest influence of all. Um, the, the acidification, the deoxidisation, and what, what is the moving food supplies for the, the birds uh, and things like that, and also fish? And what worries me is <clears throat> how is your ability to actually measure um, can I keep up with the speed of what's happening in terms of climate change? Because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you actually can do that, given well, the, yeah. the speed of change. Absolutely. So where um, we've got good data and where... where species and habitats have been regularly monitored over a long period and climate change is something that happens over many decades. You, it needs to be to, to attribute um, an, an effect or a trend to climate change you need to be able to discriminate it from all sorts of other shorter term perturbations in the environment um, from the weather effectively. Um, so where we, where we do have those good records we are able to see that, that that species whose normal distribution is in colder waters than here, so they've got an affinity for cold water, have tended to decline since the 1980s. Our seas have 
warmed by about a degree since the middle of the 1980s. And those species which have got an affinity for warmer waters, that Mediterranean species, species normally found off um, the coast of North Africa, they've tended to increase. So there's a, there is a, an ongoing shift in the balance of the composition of our marine communities from cold water forms towards warm water forms. And everywhere we've looked, plankton, fishes, um, rocky shore invertebrates and seaweeds, we've tended to see this general shift. It's not to say that those new species won't kind of um, perform the same functions as the colder water counterparts are, but they are fundamentally altering the makeup of our, our marine ecosystems gradually over time. Sometimes those effects will be more dramatic, but but, but it's a gradual shift amongst those, those current players. Yeah. Short supplementary question from Claudia Beamish on that theme. Uh, yes, yeah, so I wonder, um, in terms of internationally, where the, the gaps are in, in what is emerging um, uh, research in relation to climate change. And also, um, the, you'll be aware that um, the blue carbon issue has been raised by this committee and... Uh, um, Perhaps rather like on land with peatlands, we, we worked um, across parties to make sure that peatlands were in the, um, the last but one, um, what was then called um, Report on Policy and Proposals and now a Climate Change Plan. And there was a box on uh, blue carbon, but the argument was that the research wasn't um, detailed enough to, to deal with it. Um, and I'm aware there is international work, but there's also the work of SNH, and I wonder if you can shed any light on both those issues, any further light on, on the climate yeah. change issues, but also the blue carbon specifically. Yes, OK, well, you're getting very close to my heart now. Um, <laughs> uh, as, as one of my uh, one of the hats I wear is as chairman of the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum on, on behalf of, of, of Scottish Government. Um, and... Um, you know, this is this is a, a an issue which sort of arose a number of years ago, where blue carbon was identified as a as an important uh, sink for for carbon, uh, but the the focus originally was on mangroves, uh, mm -hmm. seagrass, yeah. and 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 salt marsh. Now we still have significant amounts of salt marsh, and we have seagrass beds in Scotland. We don't yet have mangroves, but climate change, you never know. Um, but uh, what I, I was interested in when um, we, we established the, the initial uh, survey, uh, the ports that were done by SNH um, that, that Mike contributed to, uh, was to try and expand that envelope of, of habitats that might trap carbon and store carbon in the marine environment. So, um, you know, uh, the, the, the reports that were produced uh, uh, six or seven years ago now um, stimulated, uh, identified and stimulated further research, which is ongoing at the moment, uh, that is being funded both by uh, SNH through PhD studentships and uh, through Scottish uh, government uh, PhD uh, supported uh, um, funding. Uh, now, that research is answering a number of key questions. Um, uh, PhDs last for three and a half years, so we haven't quite got the answers to all those questions yet, uh, but we're beginning to collect information which is going to help us understand the, the, the true extent and the true importance of the different habitats in the marine environment. You know, and and uh, the, the numbers that we're, we're now getting in terms of the amount of carbon is stored in these different marine habitats uh, is in some cases orders of magnitude greater than what was estimated in the original reports because they were being done on, on limited information. And one of the really startling sort of facts, if you like, is that in a, 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 a unit area of sea loch sediment, there is five times as much carbon stored there as in the equivalent area of peat bog. Um, so, you know, the marine environment, again, comes out as, as, as the best place. Uh, um, but, you know, seriously, you know, there are significant amounts of carbon being stored and trapped. It's not to say that those, those stores are not vulnerable, 
they're vulnerable to disturbance from activities that uh, disturb the, the, the seabed. Uh, they're vulnerable to ocean acidification because much of that carbon is, is trapped in calcareous skeletons. So there is the danger that in the future that carbon could be re released into the into the uh, in, in the atmosphere. Um, Questions I have from, from colleagues about uh, the degradation of the seabed. Uh, Angus, did you want to cover that, or is Stuart going to? Carbon, as he's an expert, very very briefly. Is that all right, convener, or are we too short of time? I'm worried about time. Can you maybe okay. come back to that because I'd like to move on to talking about degradation of the seabed. Angus. Yeah, if I could, convener, thanks. Um, you, just sticking with the OSPAR uh, assessment um, of, of seabed habitats, if I could just go back to the stats that I mentioned earlier on. Um, I mentioned 86% of the assessed area in the Greater North Sea and the Celtic Seas are physically disturbed, and worryingly, of which 58% is, ha is highly disturbed, um, and that consistent fishing pressure occurs in 74% of all of the assessed areas. So. Um, can I ask how um, you would say seabed habitats support the wider marine uh, ecosystem uh, and to what extent particularly uh, is human activity causing degradation of the seabed? Um, so in, in terms of the first part of your question about how um, seabed habitats support the wider marine ecosystem, um, I, I think uh, they're really important um, because there are a lot of different other um, species in the marine environment that would rely on seabed habitats in, in some form or another, um, as well as being important on their own right. So um, other species may rely on seabed habitats for shelter, um, to rest. They might rely on them to uh, uh, escape from predators or for feeding. So there's a, a number of different roles that, that seabed habitats um, actually play there, which um, uh, in, I, I think show the, the valuable role that they, they play in the marine environment. Um, and then um, uh, the other part of your question was about the, how they've been disturbed. Um, and so that's an, um, the indicator that you referred to was um, uh, about the seafloor integrity. Um, and that's an indicator that's um, been recently developed through the OSPAR work. Um, and I referred to that earlier that we're still going through the process of looking at other indicators as well. Um, what we're hoping to do is um, also developing indicators around the biogenic habitats. So we mentioned um, around mill beds uh, earlier too um, and there are a range of other biogenic habitats that would be included within that things like horse mussel beds flame shell beds um, in terms of the um, uh, disturbance um, a lot of the um, biogenic habitats uh, that we uh, have around Scotland have been included within the Scottish MPA network um, and we've been working with Marine Scotland on that to not only set up the MPA network but Marine Scotland have then been leading on putting fisheries management measures in place um, to to ensure protection of those um, most sensitive marine habitats. Um, and uh, another part of work that Marine Scotland is, is leading on at the moment <coughs> is called the Review of Priority Marine Features. Um, and um, that's looking at those most sensitive marine habitats where they occur outside uh, the MPA network. Um, so it's not saying that um, you know uh, there should be widespread controls on the fishing industry from that, uh, that perspective in terms of the benthic habitats. There are some areas in, in the sea where you know, they're relatively exposed, we've got coarse sediments, they're, they're good areas for, for fishing activity to happen in, um, but it's actually looking at the areas that are most sensitive to that, that activity, like the biogenic habitats, and um, looking at what we can do to protect those so that you can get a, a sustainable fishery happening alongside, um, you know, protection of those uh, uh, environments. Okay. Um, just a little thing uh, on uh, human activity. Um, that one of the things the Joint Nature of the Conservation Committee says is that stopping dumping sewage at sea and uh, the introduction of discards ban in the fishing industry is contributing to a decline in certain species of seabirds. Is that a fair comment that's generally accepted? And if it is, um, how do we deal with this negative effect of what we're thinking of as a positive couple of interventions. Um, 
I think in terms of the comment about introducing a discards ban and that having an impact on some species of seabirds, that's inevitably going to be the case. Um, we've had some species of seabirds, particularly the kind of more generalist um, uh, species and the, the ones that you would maybe describe as more sort of scavengers that have done really well from um, the way in which we've managed uh, fishery over the last few decades. Um, so if we then get to a position where we're putting um, better fisheries management measures in place for actually managing fish stocks, there is going to be a, a knock-on impact in terms of those species of seabirds that have benefited the most. And I think we just have to accept that that's a, that's a consequence of that. Um, and it's not something that we have to then um, feel that we have to, to mitigate against. There will be knock-on effects of any management interventions that you put in place in the marine environment or the terrestrial environment. And as long as we understand those and uh, can, can then make a decision about them, I think, I think that's OK. Yeah, I, I think... I think we have to take great care that we're not beguiled into the idea that the only good thing is the fact the thing is going up. Um, you know, uh, nature is, is, uh, works in cycles, you know, and, and organisms have peaks and troughs. We don't have the length of data necessarily in all of these species to understand what their, the length of their cycles are. So, you know, the fact that... Um, we have been enhancing the habitat, if you like, for seabirds by, by discards. Um, you know, they've done well as that. We, we've, in a sense, created an abnormal uh, situation there. Uh, and the fact that the, the, the numbers are now declining um, is a reflection of that as much as anything else. What we have to be careful of is that we are not creating uh, further uh, conditions which are depressing those uh, th those populations artificially, but the fact that the numbers are, 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 are fluctuating in itself, I don't think, should be uh, of concern. If we understand the reason, and the reason is ban on discards, then you know that that is fine. But what we need to be sure of is that we're not doing something else which is further depressing those, animals, those populations. Supplementary from Mark Ruskell. You're saying that we have got less data on non-commercial species, um, but what about commercial species? I mean, we haven't had an MSY set, for example, for the wrasse fishery. There's no MSY set for razor clam fishery at the moment. Are there still big, big gaps there? Um, so I guess, yes, there's the commercial uh, species that we've got the long-term data sets on, which are the ones that have been, um, the data's then fed into the large fish indicator that's that's been used. Um, you're right that there are other species where there's a more recent commercial interest, um, where we have much less data on those. Um, and um, Scottish natural heritage position would be that if we're going to exploit a, a species, then we should be looking to create a, a good baseline of environmental data, including on the, the stock, the state of the stock itself. Um, and in that way, we can judge um, what impact uh, any uh, harvesting of that stock might have um, with the idea that we then can understand it better um, and make decisions um, that will lead us to a more sustainable fishery in the future. Because if we don't have the information uh, that provides us with a baseline, um, we have to make a lot more assumptions and we have to be a lot more precautionary, I would say, in the way that we harvest that fishery. As I've said... Um, can, I, can I ask, um, move on to talking about the uh, evidence from recent studies on um, plastic pollution on marine ecosystems? If I can open up that very current and controversial uh, part of this. Not an area of my expertise, I'm afraid, but, but the, there is obviously a lot of current interest in the research community into the impacts of... of, of uh, plastics and good evidence that ingestion of large plastic items by by the bigger um, organisms like whales and turtles and, and seabirds has a tremendously damaging impact on them. It, it prevents them from eating their normal food items. They, they often starve as a result. Um, interesting results recently from a study in, in, at SAMS shown that actually plastic fragments have been around in the ocean for a very long time, and the deep sea species from the rock or trough show particle fragments when they were collected from the 1970s. So it, it, it is a problem. It's a problem we've, we've had for a long time. There's a lot of 
current interest, particularly with media exposure of, of, of the, da the dangers of plastics. Um, I guess there's, there are the, there's a strong positive message in that it seems to have increased people's awareness of their environment and the damage that they're doing to it. And hopefully we'll have some incredibly positive uh, outcomes for, for looking after it. I mean, that's a, that's a very stark um, figure from the OSPAR report. 93% of North Sea foamers have got plastic in their stomachs. Yeah. I mean, that's horrific. Yes. Um, yeah. So what, what else are we, we finding? Uh, around plastic, you know, that's a, a massive effect it's having on a particular breed I, I of think, bird. I think, I mean, foamers have been a, a focus of, of, of research, uh, and that's why we have that really stark figure uh -huh. for, for foamers. I think uh, you would probably f find similar um, figures for, for many other species as well. I mean, yeah, so it's it, like it an is, indication it, of, it's of an indication. It's an indication. I mean, and, and as, as Mike says, I mean, I think that, you know, the plastics debate has, has if, if nothing else, it's served as a, as a wake-up call to the, to the conditions in the marine environment as, as a whole. You know, we, we have abused the marine environment for too long. Um, my, my take on it is that it's important that we address the plastics issue as best we can. You know, the, the horse has bolted to a certain extent, but we can, we can address it to some degree. But... I, it, it should not be the cause of us losing sight of the bigger challenges. And the bigger challenges are, f are, are what we face around climate change. Mm. Uh, if, if, if the oceans continue to warm, if the oceans continue to acidify, if the oceans continue to, to, to deoxygenate, it won't matter how much plastic is floating about in the ocean because there will be nothing left in the ocean to be damaged by the plastic. Okay. John Scott. And, and notwithstanding, um, I'm concerned about the ingestion of our food of plastic by the fish species that we are more and more being encouraged to eat. Well, is there any work being done on the long-term implications for human health of the ingestion of plastics and the, the, the fact that that must ultimately end up as part of the, the fibre uh, of uh, these fishes? Uh, uh, certainly not my area of expertise, and I think it's an area which has only just recently become, you know, would become conscious of, you know, because it, really? it's microplastics that we're talking about. So, uh -huh. you know, I think we're beginning to understand the, the loading of microplastics in our, in our food uh, species, but uh, I'm, I'm certainly not qualified to, to, to sort of say whether there's any research going on in, into that area. Informed guesswork would, would do. So, so, Informed guesswork would do. Uh, well, I mean, if, 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 if there is not research going on into it, it seems like a very, um, a very good area of, uh, of, of research to get into because it, it's, it's important. And, you know, uh, um, there is certainly, I would say, some evidence that, uh, you know, it, it, may, it could be uh, a ticking time bomb for the future if we're if we're all ingesting uh, large amounts of microplastics. But I, you know, I'm not an expert, and I, I, I there don't are know. there are specific concerns about microplastics as a sort of vehicle to ingest other, yeah. well, diseases potentially. But I'm thinking about other pollutants. Yeah. So so some some molecules will stick to plastic, and by ingesting that plastic, those molecules will get inside you, and where they have a toxic effect, they may well. Um, you know, yeah. have have health health related issues. Uh, one of the problems thought of some while ago was the issue of um, endocrine disruptors, so things which interfer with the, the natural hormone balance in your body. And, and uh, there seems to be some evidence of some fish species becoming feminised because those the plastic associated pollutants have got um, estrogen like properties. To another part of, of plastic pollution and pollution in general caused by human beings. Just how big is, is on the scale is entanglement issues around like marine mammals um, for you know the, the debris that comes from say fishing vessels. 
So at the moment, there's a, a project going on which is called the Scottish Entanglement Alliance, um, and that's a collaboration between various different uh, organisations in Scotland. Um, and I, I guess um, there's a there's not just a focus on um, the kind of the lost uh, fishing gear or other kind of plastics. It's also looking at fishing gear that's being actively used at the moment. So whether that's that's creels or whether it's uh, nets that are being set. Um, so that project at the moment is at the stage where there's been a lot of work done with um, uh, fishing communities to actually understand um, kind of what kind of entanglements are happening, um, what kind of gear is involved and, and which kind of species are, are mainly involved um, and the project is now at the stage where over the next few months they'll be writing up that work um, and we should be able to get a much better idea of, of actually what's happening particularly on the west coast of Scotland but actually in other other places as well um, and um, that's really important because we can understand whether there are kind of particular areas where this is happening more than in other areas then we can focus mitigation in those places but also if we can understand whether there's particular gear types or whether there's um, particular ways in which the gears have been set which might be problematic um, then we can start to, to look at that but I, th I think the importance of that project is that it is um, it's got such a wide range of people that are involved in it that are recognizing that there's an issue there um, and it's about just making sure that we can kind of keep that collaboration going um, and get the understanding that the fishing industry have and the understanding that um, people like SRUC have got when they're working with the, um, uh, the work that they're doing from the stranding scheme so actually understand the impact that it's having on the animals so that we can identify what the solutions might be jointly. Okay. John Scott. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, the IB's report um, makes pretty horrific reading. Um, what's the relevance of the findings of the report in Scotland and how has Scotland contributed to that report? Is there anything positive to see or is it all <laughs> negative as it appears to be? Um, well, I, I I think it is relevant to Scotland. I think it's really useful to have a report that draws together so much information um, at that global scale because it allows us to put the, you know, what's happening within Scotland in within that broader context. Um, I think um, it's very useful for that report to set out the, the kind of key drivers that there are that are affecting both terrestrial and marine environments and, and they, they apply equally in Scotland. So things that we've already mentioned like climate change, uh, like pollution, um, changes in land and sea use, they're equal applicable um, but I, I think also um, uh, there are key messages coming out of it which which are fairly depressing in terms of the sort of um, the area of our seas that has been changed by human activities and the impacts that those have had um, those are things that we are we are seeing in Scotland too but on a I guess a slightly more positive note the the kinds of um, solutions that are presented in the report in relation to the marine environment things like making sure that we have an ecosystem based approach to fisheries management um, things like using spatial planning and using marine protected areas are all things that we've made significant progress on um, since the introduction of the Marine Act. So, um, you know, there are definitely real issues that we should be aware of, but there, there are things that we can do about them. Um, I think the things in relation to climate change are going to um, uh, maybe require a more significant transformation in the way that we, we address and manage our seas um, than some of the management interventions that we've had in the past. I, I, I was got something to say. I mean, I hear what you say, uh, Gillam, but uh, spatial planning um, uh, and uh, ecosystem planning of themselves won't solve the problem. I appreciate there may be a precursor to solutions, but is, is there, is there, is, are there solutions out there? Or is it the whole thing, the, the feeling I'm getting from this morning is that everything's being driven by climate change, regrettably, well, well, uh, although there are other incidental factors. Um, yes, so I mean I would um, agree with what John had said earlier. If we don't, if we don't really tackle uh, climate change, and we obviously know that we've we've had a declared uh, climate emergency, if we don't tackle that, um, then uh, you know that's uh, that's uh, nothing else. I guess the other things are, are more incidental. The other things we still need to keep working on those. Um, but if if we don't start to tackle climate change more seriously, then then we will have serious yeah, issues. I, I wouldn't say that nothing else matters because I mean it's going to take us time. To, to even begin to really tackle climate change and, and we've got to work to to ensure that you know once we get if we get some of those issues you know under control or, or, or better understood we still have habitats and species there to 
to benefit from that. So we, climate change is, is the big issue, but that's not to say that we should ignore all the other issues that are affecting the marine environment. And, and I think... Sorry, um, I, <laughs> I, I was just going to, yes, just echo what you were saying there. So if we can understand what the impacts of climate change are, are going to be and we can understand what the impacts from other um, activities are going to be, um, that allows us to, um, going back to some of what we were saying uh, earlier there, um, is making sure that we're not putting additional pressure on, on the marine environment on top of the climate change um, so, that, so that we actually can make sure that we um, still have a, a marine environment that we can depend on for all of the goods and services that it provides at the moment. Um, climate change will mean we will lo inevitably lose a lot of the species we currently care about, but we'll gain a lot of other ones that we want to we will want to protect in the future. So, so I think we need to look after our environment for that for that changing um, biota that's about to arrive. Um, some of those things will be being in turn lost from the tropics. So it's a, it's a massively and rapidly changing world. We do still need to look after it as much as we can. And if, if regulating things like the way we use and develop the ocean um, is important, we should, we should continue to do that as, as much as we can. It's not a, it's not a, a message of complete despair. It, it's that we should still be looking after what, what we're going to have in the future. Okay. Just be different. Claudia Beamish has a question on blue carbon. Uh, right, thank you, convener. Uh, just to um, hear from uh, Michael what, what your view is on blue carbon and very briefly if there um, is a likelihood that not in the re um, revised climate change plan, obviously we're after the climate change bill, but in the next climate change plan, whether we might be able to start to be developing actions for it. I think... We are, are at an early-ish stage with, with understanding blue carbon and how carbon in the marine environment is locked away effectively for forever, how we, how we can remove that excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bury it in coastal sediments. That we, we, we think we know what all the parts of that system are. Uh, plants fix carbon dioxide from, from the water. They turn it into solid stuff, and that stuff gets buried in the, in, in the sediment. There's still a lot of real uncertainties. How much of that plant material is, is actually locked away forever and how much is actually just respired away? I think the projects that have been started under Scotland's Blue Carbon Forum, the initiative funded by Marine Scotland and, and Scottish Government, is, is going some way towards addressing some of those uncertainties. We know it's going to be important, and I think we do really need to look ahead to the time when we do have more accurate information, but um, at the moment, still, still broad uncertainties there. I, I, I think the other, just briefly, uh, the other project that is underway at the moment is um, there is a blue carbon audit of Orkney, the Orkney Marine Region underway at the moment. Uh, and I think that will um, will report uh, hopefully later this month. Uh, yeah. um, and um, I think that will... It's never been attempted anywhere else, as far as we're aware. Uh, and that will give us information to help inform management of the marine environment at that sort of more local area. Um, it's not going to come up with absolute... Uh, numbers because again we don't have all the information we need but it, it, it is I think an important first step in terms of in getting blue carbon uh, engagement at a marine regional planning level mm -hmm. to see whether or not it can be taken into account when we're talking about the, the, the full range of management at, at any scale. So that report, I think, uh, will, will uh, take us a, a good bit forward in just understanding how well we can um, quantify the blue carbon resource in a, in a region. Thank you. Um, Mark Russell's questions on invasive species. What, what, what impact are invasive species uh, you know, contributing to in the marine environment? 
Um, it varies depending on the, the different aspects of the, the marine environment that you look at. And maybe if I start off, and you'll probably have other things to, to add onto this. And um, I, I mean, if you if you look at the um, benthic habitats and species, um, they can be affected by invasive non-native species that, um, uh, for example, would outcompete them. So it would um, outcompete them for, for space or for um, for um, nutrients. Um, you can um, have um, invasive non-native species that would actually, we've had examples with the carpet sea squirt on the west coast, where they've actually just, um, as it says, it carpets the marine life and, and, and literally smothers it. Um, then if you look at other, I'm just giving a few examples, but if you look at um, uh, seabirds, for example, there's been well-publicised uh, occasions where you've had um, marine, uh, sorry, not marine, but you've had mammal, uh, mammalian predators um, on seabird islands um, and the impact that they have on breeding seabird colonies. Um, and there's a number of different things that you can do in response to that. And, and very much the, um, the approach at the moment is to um, prevent invasive non-native species from uh, arriving in Scotland in the first place. And there are certainly invasive non-native species in other parts of the UK that we would hope that um, are not transferred to Scotland. Um, so preventing them uh, from being transferred in the, f in the first place, um, and then if it's possible to control them or contain them, um, and in some cases it may be possible to remove them, but um, removal of, of invasive non-native species below the water is very, very difficult. So it's, it's really on prevention as the, the kind of uh, first line of defence, really. Um, so most species in the marine environment are rare and only a few are common and the same goes for, for non-native species. I think most of them are just there in, in small quantities but occasionally, like the carpet sea squirt, they become common and at that point they will have a noticeable impact on the, on the ecosystem. I think the other challenge that we have going forward is identifying what is uh, a, a, a natural invasive or non-native species, i.e. as a result of climate change and something has arrived here independent of, 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 of a human vector, um, you know, and what can we do about that? Probably not a lot, but as Katie said, there, there are other measures that we can put in place to ensure that things that couldn't get here by themselves, you know, um, um, we, sh we should do everything we can to, to, to prevent that but it's a big challenge. You, you have recreational boats visiting from around the world coming into marinas. It only takes one of them to have something that it picked up in the Mediterranean um, on its hull uh, for, for that to, to drop off and, and, and there you have a, a challenge. So it, it, there are big challenges but, uh, um, and we need to, we need to sort of dis, distinguish between things that have got here because the climate and the marine environment is changing under their own steam, if you like, and then others that have got here through human uh, vectors. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. I want to thank you all very much for the um, evidence that you've given us this morning. I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly to allow a change in panel. Thank you.
Welcome back. Um, we continue discussion with our second panel, who will be focused on opportunities for marine planning and licensing systems to deliver more for the marine environment. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Charles Nathan, uh, Marine Conservation Plan for RSPB Scotland. Uh, Anne Breeden, Senior Manager for Policy and Planning of Crown State Scotland. Uh, Linda Rosborough, Chair of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And Patricia Hawthorne um, from Shepherd and Wedderburn and uh, for Scottish Renewables. Good morning to you all. Um, Claudia Beamish has our first questions. Thank you, convener, and again, uh, good morning to you all. Um, I'd like to focus on the marine enhancement statutory duty, which, of course, you all know, but for the public record, is from Section 3 of the Marine Scotland Act 2010 and places a general duty on Scottish ministers and public authorities, I stress, in exercising any function that affects the Scottish marine area, and I quote, to act in a way best calculated to further the achievement of sustainable development, including the protection and, where appropriate, enhancement of the health of that area, so far as is consistent with proper exercise of that function. And often in this committee and pre the previous committee in the last session of the Parliament, um, many of us have been highlighting the issue of enhancement as well as the recovery and protection of, of our marine environment. So, um, I wonder if, um, just in turn, you could tell us um, what the priorities for delivering marine enhancement in Scotland are, in your view, and indeed, who is um, best placed to deliver them? So, whoever wants to start. Go ahead. It's quite a broad question. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, so, in terms of enhancement, um, what we're looking for is, is, is recovery of the... Um, ecological um, diversity and um, health of, of Scotland seas. Um, I think the marine legislation, the marine protected area programme, those all provide tools to enable enhancement to happen, um, either through um, protecting um, and managing activities that are currently damaging or preventing activities that could be damaging. Um, beyond, beyond that, and I know you're, you're wishing to go beyond that, um, I think people are thinking about restoration um, in relation to the sea. For example, we have the uh, restoration of um, shellfish at uh, Dornoch Firth, um, which has been taken forward, which I think is a very exciting project. Um, our Firths would once have been very rich with shellfish. Um, a number of problems meant that those stocks were hugely depleted. They sustained large fisheries. Um, they captured carbon. Um, I think that sort of vision for how um, the ecological potential of um, you know, what's a very wealthy sea ecologically could be restored um, is beginning to happen, but it's still early days. Thank you. And anyone else on the panel who wants to comment on that? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, I, I think definitely en enhancement is the kind of restoration mode is where we want to be with the National Marine Plan and, and the implementation of uh, the planning system. We've got it all in, in place. Um, but I think one of the potential... Uh, we might kind of fall into thinking that, like the terrestrial environment, we can do the same offshore. And there's quite distinct difference, obviously. Um, there's dynamic and mobile species. It's a very dynamic environment. Um, and I think what that demands from those who are active within the marine environment, different, different uh, human activities, is um, to kind of take a step back and be a bit more strategic. Unlike on terrestrial, where you're able to have a project and be able to deliver any mitigation or offsetting you might require within the project site. You might not be able to do that in the marine environment, and certainly you, you can't in some cases. So there needs to be kind of an understanding that um, the, those that are benefiting from the marine environment through the, uh, the, the different sectors are able to contribute towards um, potentially enhancement, but all the other factors that we'll probably come on to in terms of baseline monitoring and research. Um, at an, in a strategic level, so it might not be related to their individual projects or their individual activities, but as a sector, I think, um, or sectors, there needs to be a commitment to, to contribute to restoration, um, and that's going to have to come through the guidance and kind of strategic 
oversight uh, that the National Marine Plan can offer. Right, just before we come to um, the other two panellists, my understanding is that restoration um, is not the same as enhancement. Enhancement is, is going beyond. Now, I may be wrong on that. That's what I thought was the case. And we seem to be a little bit confused as to where we are with that. So yeah. can we just clarify that first before we proceed? So, From so your perspectives, you know, I'm not sorry. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Certainly, rest restoration, I think it'd be... Um, We'd be in a good place if we could do enhancement, as, as you say, at going beyond beyond where, um, what's needed, or meeting, having met our targets, and, and going beyond. Certainly, I guess there is a focus on the restoration aspect that is okay. that is required. Um, you've had in the previous session around the you know the marine marine, marine abundance of seabirds uh, since the 1990s has 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 been below target. Um, so it's showing a huge. Uh, problem with the, the population of seabirds. Right, others or not, if not, I've got a... Yeah. You don't need to press your button. Well done for you, right, don't worry. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a scientist here. I've listened uh, to the end of the discussion at the, the previous uh, session, and uh, I suppose I'm trying to bring the, the business uh, perspective to, to some of this discussion as well. And I think um, the renewable sector would very much regard their, their objective, their business objectives, as aligned with net gain or enhancement, or if we're using that terminology. Um, I, I think uh, if there's a concern from the point of view of industry, is just understanding what that means before they embark upon something or are, um, are asked to embark upon something. And I sense from, from reading before this session today that we're not yet at the point of being able to define what we mean by net gain, particularly in the marine environment. Now, obviously, there is a better understanding in the terrestrial environment, and, and therefore there's something that we can try and deliver. But um, I believe as an industry, we are engaged in a number of discussions uh, in different fora to look at the issue, and uh, we very much want to participate in these discussions, but the key thing for us would be just understanding what it is we are trying to deliver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Annie. Hello, um, so I think for us, as, a, as you know, we're a very new organisation with um, sort of different objectives to what we had, what we worked under as the Crown Estate. And for us, um, sustainable development is obviously now um, our key goal, really, to promote that and in all of our work. And so, really, for us, going forward, I think we're um, still at the stage where we're sort of understanding the opportunities that are presented to us and really finding our feet in all of this. And we're keen to work with all of the, you know, the stakeholders, Marine Scotland and sort of colleagues around the table here today so I think for us over the next um, couple of years, really, it's a topic that is of great interest to us. And I think as we go forward, we'll hopefully be able to come up with some firmer plans. But as yet, we're um, still looking at the opportunity for us in this field. Right, thank you. And uh, in terms of um, delivering enhancement in the marine environment, um, would anyone on the panel like to comment on whether you see funding as the key barrier or whether there are other barriers. We're going to talk about the detail of funding through other committee members' um, lines of questioning, but in a general sense, please, now. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's kind of going back to the, the strategic kind of focus. Um, as, as Patricia was saying earlier, um, uh, you know, if a sector just wants to be almost to some degree wants to be told what, you know, where, where, they, where they lie, and what they may or may not be able to contribute to, and 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 how um, how they can pr provide uh, positive input into into the management of the marine environment. Um, so I think it really is kind of looking at it from a strategic point of view and articulating that um, through through the likes of the national marine plan and and forthcoming regional marine plans. Anyone else? Okay. Right. Move on to questions from Mark Ruskell. Um, I think quite a useful distinction there between restoration and enhancement. So can I ask you then about how the current uh, consenting and licensing regime really delivers enhancement? To what extent does it do that? Is it hardwired into that, into those regimes? And how? If you could give me specific examples, that would be useful. 
everybody has to answer every question. So just no. indicate to me if you want to ans answer Mark's question. I think I was yeah. glancing at Linda Rosborough. But... Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that it's a wildlife trust issue that I have a view on, but um, I was thinking maybe Patricia's uh, renewables might, might speak to it. Yeah, I'm happy to comment on that. I mean, I think at, at the moment, um, yes, I think to me, uh, bringing in the concept of enhancement of the environment, of the marine environment within the marine planning context, it, it's where it sits most comfortably. Bringing it into licensing concerns me again if we don't have the clarity of purpose. Uh, and, and the way to measure whether we're achieving what we need to achieve or not. So, you know, I'm very much minded as a, as a lawyer that for a, for a marine licence condition, it has to be reasonable, it has to be enforceable, it has to mm -hmm. be precise. Um, so we need to just move the thinking on a bit further uh, and make sure if we are seeking to licence something like that, that it has a, you know, a, a precise nature, it, it has a precise goal and uh, we can measure whether it's mm -hmm. being achieved or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is quite important. I mean, the other aspect of this is, is perhaps a broader point in that when you do get to measuring net gain, you know, as, as an industry, we are ultimately tackling climate change. How do you measure that in the calculation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come in on that. I think, uh, again, it's something um, actually being able to point to specifically, I couldn't give you an answer. Um, it's incredibly difficult, particularly at the project level when you're talking about licensing, um, for that particular activity to contribute to a, uh, an enhancement activity, you know, positive conservation measures, I suppose you could call them. Um, and, and again, it might not be realistic to, to require that of an individual project because it, the, the actual enhancement might be required on the other, other coastline, on the west coast, for instance, or, um, or, or vice versa. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, definitely a tricky one. And I think we need to, there's a kind of a need for more information and um, a, a greater level of understanding. And I think some of the basics around um, what marine planning can do to, to deliver the baseline monitoring that was talked about in the previous session to deliver the research that's required to, 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 for the, the, um, the knowledge gaps around our understanding of how activities are impacting on, on wildlife and, and habitats. And I guess the third element is um, the kind of positive conservation measures. That's where you would identify what we could deliver in terms of protecting the carbon stores or uh, protecting certain species uh, and, and habit habitats. So you've identified a, a big opportunity there. Are there other opportunities, and are there particular sectors that are that are addressing that need for an enhancement more than others at the moment? Which are the sectors that are really performing in terms of marine enhancement? Anyone? Go on, give it a go. <laughs> So we're, we're working quite closely with the offshore wind industry, which is obviously a, a, a major um, existing potential future uh, sector within, within the Scot Scottish marine environment. And we're working quite closely trying to answer some of these questions, but obviously um, there's, there's discussions kind of ongoing, but there's willingness there, certainly. And, and I think there will be from other sectors, but again, it's kind of going back to, they're not the experts, they, they need to be, to some degree, kind of guided as to what, what they can and can't contribute to. If, if, forgive me, Mark, if I can join it. In the last session, we were told, there's lots of data there. There's lots of data, that, but there's a, a shortfall in funding and actually analyzing that data. I mean, surely that's a gap that, for example, the people that are applying for licenses, you know, if you're not asked to be the experts in any of this or to do any of the work, you could actually just put funding in for the experts to actually analyze the data that's already there. Am I, am I being too simplistic? Um, yeah. I mean, there is a lot of ongoing research, obviously. Um, I mean, Marine Scotland have, um, you know, extensive um, an extensive research program. They've got their um, Scott Mayer program, which is looking at um, the different effects on different sectors from offshore energy. Um, and that, 
allows them to sort of bring it together and have a sort of strategic overview of it. But I think a lot of the, the research is looking at understanding potential impact still, rather than um, taking it a step further and looking at then what industries can do in terms of marine enhancement. I think you're right. It's around the funding, and but yeah, as, as Annie says, around um, a lot of the research that the, the marine energy sector is looking at is um, the impacts, and the, you know, really getting some certainty on what the potential impacts might be. But it's going that extra step, and I think there's certainly there is a willingness there, as I said, to contribute towards other activities, other areas of research to understand the data and get a bit more certainty about what might happen to certain habitats with the effects of climate change um, or, or uh, intense, intensive use of activities. Mark? I mean, what do you see then as the role of the licensing regime then in funding that type of research and funding marine enhancement? From my perspective, um, the licensing is about ensuring that we, we operate the way we say we're going to operate. I think, as, as has been said already, we do a, a, a huge amount of um, evidence gathering through the process in, in terms of applying for a license uh, and then uh, carrying out a development. The purpose of the license is just to ensure that, that uh, we do what we're meant to do with that, that information. Um, I think the funding side of it is, is perhaps a bit of a conflation of issues. Um, I think there is a, a huge willingness on the part of the renewable sector to be involved in these discussions, to put man hours into investigating these things, to share information, to share data that they have produced that they are paying for themselves. Um, I think. Uh, where it becomes more difficult in the licensing context is if you are just looking for an unconnected fund, uh, something which doesn't actually relate to the, the development itself any more than delivering the development helps to tackle climate change in a general sense. But could, that, could the licensing regime be feeding into information which is then useful for the industry in terms of how you mitigate projects. I'm thinking of international examples here. Uh, in Norway, for example, um, they've got a new licensing round around aquaculture where only companies that strongly innovate and come up with effectively closed containment can actually go on to then take a, a, a license for an expanded site. Are there other examples like that where you see a feedback into industry innovation through licensing? So there's, there's definitely opportunity for the, the planning and licensing to, um, to motivate innovation in an industry. So if, if there's a clear um, understanding of what the impacts are and how they could be mitigated through some sort of uh, innovation, I mean, we're, we're looking at um, the potential for f floating renewables being able to be situated further from shore and in deeper waters are more likely to be uh, less impactful on, on the marine environment, particularly when you thinking about seabirds. So there's potential there, just very simplistic in terms of um, the planning system actually supporting the rollout of floating uh, areas for floating renewables, for instance, which could be a long-term goal, but uh, ultimately deliver more capacity for, for less environmental effect. Mm -hmm. From Stuart Stevenson. I think, um, I, I think this is probably directed uh, at uh, Scottish Renewables rather than others, although others may wish to comment. Um, isn't it time we actually moved from simply viewing this as a how do we mitigate the damage that's done to looking for opportunities to actually use the development to improve? And I give an example which is not marine, where the consent for open cast mining in my colleague uh, Finlay's uh, part of the, the country resulted in a substantial improvement in the quality of the water and the banks on the Nith, which resulted in a dramatic rise in the number of salmon that were making it up the river to spawn. Now, improving the Nith was really nothing to do with open cast mining, but doing that improvement was a condition of getting a license to do open cast mining. And it was clearly very successful in a relatively short space of time. Are we now in a position where we should be looking at this authorization to potentially do some negatives being conditional on 
there being associated substantial positives? And would that require changes in the law? Because I'm absolutely accept the renewable industry is doing what it is currently being asked to do, and I accept that. But should we move beyond that? Would anyone like to take that on, Ms Hawthorne? Yeah. Back to me again. Um, yeah, well, I, I think um, uh, I think there is a place for that, but again, in the co in the the context of net gain, we have to understand what it is we're trying to deliver, mm -hmm. uh, and that it is realistic that what it is we're we're focusing energy and and resources at will actually deliver benefit uh, at the end of the day. And I think uh, if the industry is being asked to do something on the back of a project, they need to understand why that is uh, connected with their project beyond the wider goal of tackling climate change, which is, is a worthy so, goal. So can I to give you an example, which is not a well-informed comment by me. Some, when we put things in the seabed, there are opportunities for creating reefs, which are opportunity for fish breeding and refuge, which create more food for seabirds. You know, it goes, kind of all the way up the chain. So aren't there examples that your industry and other industries that are out there, it's not just about renewables, could be doing, but more, more in terms of public policy, being required to do as a condition of being allowed into the environment? I mean, again, I would say that, that there are these examples. Uh, there are research projects going on around about most of the projects that, that uh, I'm involved with, uh, and, and they are valuable research projects. Uh, as you say, they are largely being volunteered by the sector at the moment, and I think that's probably where I, I think is, it, it should sit. Um, there are other pressures on these industries, as you know. Mm. Uh, we have to always look at the balance of cost to the consumer of, of providing energy and what developers are being asked to pay for through their projects. So it's, it's about finding an appropriate balance. Um, Well-directed funding is, is always looked at sympathetically. Linda Rosper. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the best examples of this is, was what was referred to earlier on, which was about Shetland and, and, and the Zetland Act and the story there where um, you know, very foresighted people on the island um, took um, a, a long-term view at a time when not pe many people even believed there was going to be a substantial industry there or, or questioned how big it would be. And you know, to the long-term benefit of, of Shetland, um, some of the resource that um, came in through the Zetland Act resources um, helps to pay for some of the work around the management of fisheries, the inshore fisheries locally through the, through the Shetland College. So I think there's, there's you know, examples of being foresighted um, and putting in tools early that mean that strategic choices can be made. Often the, the industries that we're dealing with are, are, are maybe not in a particularly good financial state. That, that's the case for certainly some, of the, some elements of the fishing industry. Um, You've also got um, issues around um, what can be done within you know, the current legislative framework. Uh, Norway, I know, did look at um, a wider set of requirements on investing businesses to do with research, local jobs, training, um, looking for a whole set of different, different benefits. Um, but I don't think went ahead with that. Um, so there are challenges when you've got investors who are looking at different places to invest and what sort of um, package is available, which means that you've got to be looking at, 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 at the, the, the wider picture and, and working at what's possible. Um, but the, the essence of it is, can we get a better way of developing and working in the sea so that we're thinking more broadly and ensuring that um, we're getting more rounded benefits is, is, is essentially a very good one, yes, that's where we need to be. Okay, before we move on to questions from, uh, apologies, you wanted to come in. I was just going to say that if anybody wants to answer a question, if they could just indicate to me, because um, I'm worried that I'm going to miss you if you, if, if you, you know, I can't really see if you want to come in or not. And, and maybe my colleagues could maybe help things along a little bit if they have actually a question for a particular panellist, if you direct it to them, that would be very helpful. Mr Nathan. Uh, it was just—it was just going to say, um, 
the kind of broad overarching principle, I suppose, is the kind of beneficiaries pays principle where there are the different activities uh, or different sectors operating in the marine environment that are benefiting from a, a natural resources effectively and from a kind of common good. So there's, there's, there's only right that they should be um, supporting the, the costs of the management and good management of that marine, that marine resource, which is both the natural marine environment, but um, potentially you know, commercial stocks or whatever it might be. I think that definitely could feed into the, the process more, uh, more readily. Um, and there are parallels to that um, through economic kind of investment around the supply chain, um, discussions that have been had with the offshore renewables industries um, of, of the last few weeks where, you know, there's, there's, there's clearly uh, Scotland is looking to, to benefit from, from these activities um, more readily. Okay, and now on to questions directly about offshore wind. Finn Carson. Oh, Kavir, I think most of them have been answered, or they've been asked already, unfortunately. <laughs> we want to sweep up um, what hasn't the, been. The, the Scottish Government has promised to produce a, a seabird conservation strategy. Does the panel have any views on what it needs to deliver and how marine industries can, can support that? Who would you like to ask? I'll probably start with RSPB, I would have thought would be a good starting point. Certainly, I mean, uh, very welcome that that's been set out in the programme for government. Um, and it's looking at uh, really identifying what, what can be done to, to support um, the restoration and enhancement of, of seabird colonies where, where, they're, where they're required or seabird populations on a national scale. Um, and, and, and this is where the, the kind of requirement for the strategic approach to be taken into context, because, um, as I said, you, an individual developer or an individual um, activity can't necessarily uh, do something on their site or within the grounds that they're, 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 they're act, act, acting upon. Um, so there's definitely a requirement to make those links and the synergies, which would really improve efficiencies as well. That it was discussed earlier that the renewables industry is, is putting a lot of effort and, and resources into understanding the environmental impacts, but actually could that be delivered in the round in terms of well, what are the interactions with offshore wind, but also fisheries and, and aquaculture, because it's all interlinked. And that's where the different focus on between, or the differences arise between terrestrial environment and, and the, the marine environment. Okay, just, just on that, so what um, issues would be associated with further expansion of offshore wind uh, to the, the marine environment? So potentially looking at displacement of uh, fisheries, uh, scallop dredging, whatever, uh, additional fishing pressures uh, in areas that uh, are, don't have wind farms, whatever. Certainly, this is um, the kind of long, the long-term view. I mean, the National Marine Plan really needs to set out, you know, what's the, what's the Scottish marine environment going to look like um, for us to achieve our net, net zero by 2050, uh, and that's likely to, to look at um, a large expansion of offshore renewables and, and I think that whilst looking at the impacts it's looking at um, what can be done to kind of mitigate the pressures across the board um, so there are obviously effects of displacement of fishing fishing grounds potentially but also obviously potentially on foraging areas for, for seabirds key, key foraging areas where they find prey to, to, to raise their chicks um, and there are also uh, fishery migration impacts potentially on the, the cabling routes as well. So, so these all need to be considered in, in the round. Okay. For wind, um, we are now seeing projects being constructed in Scotland. Um, we've got Beatrice now operational, and that will give us a great opportunity to actually understand um, the potential operational impacts on birds at these projects. Um, over the last few years, there's been projects running, um, a specific research project running at a project in the sort of east coast of England looking at um, do birds actually stop using sites? Um, are there any collision risk impacts? And so although that's been running in England, there's some valuable learnings from it, but um, colleagues at RSPB and SNH and other organisations are very keen to see um, projects looking at research projects, looking at operational wind farm projects in Scotland now. So I think we have to 
make sure that we're getting the right learnings from any projects that do happen there um, so that these can then be used by Marine Scotland to inform future offshore wind plan development. There's interest um, in developing more offshore wind in Scotland, obviously, but we need to be able to learn from what's being built now and use that to actually understand um, where we can have more development. Okay. Does the Wildlife Trust have any issues with the further expansion of offshore wind? Uh, well, we want it to be sustainable. We want to be sure that we um, are managing our seabird um, interactions properly. So, but do you yes, foresee any issues? Well, we work with our partners um, across um, the um, environmental family. And I mean, yes, there are likely to be issues. It depends where they're sighted. It depends um, what the birds are. We need to understand more. We need more research. We need more evidence. And we need very careful planning and sighting. Um, we need proper evidence-based approaches to selecting new sites. So there's, so there's not enough evidence at the moment to suggest that growth would cause a problem. It sounds like you know we're, we're in the, the midst of a growth of offshore wind, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, with regards to uh, habitats and species. At the moment, do you think there's enough information there to... Uh, um, well, we have, I mean, <sighs> We also heard a lot about climate change and offshore wind has huge potential for our climate change obligations um, and we're very mindful of that as well as the, the issues around the proper siting um, and ensuring that the planning and implementation is done properly to ensure that we minimise impact on the environment and don't threaten um, protected species and, and uh, put at risk um, populations that are key. Okay, Charles and Nathan wants to come in. Just yeah. finally. I'll come back to you. Oh. Uh, Charles Nathan wants to answer your question there. Yeah, just, just in terms of um, kind of setting the context. Uh, so the, the net zero, um, to achieve a net zero by 2050, uh, they set out a scenario of up to 75 gigawatts of offshore wind in the UK waters, which is nearly uh, 10 times more than we currently have operating. So most of it is operating south of the border, but there's huge expansion and it's an industrialization of the seas. So there, there is undoubtedly going to be risks there, environmental risks uh, with that. But obviously we need to balance that against the, the report that was, the assessment that was uh, discussed earlier, the IPBS report, which there is a kind of biodiversity crisis in many, many respects. And so that, that's a, a very significant challenge of and, and kind of demand upon national marine planning in, in Scotland to, to really kind of grasp that and try and seek <laughs> the opportunities that might, that might be able to deliver to address those two conflicting issues. Okay, and finally, uh, renewables. Uh, what work are you, are you doing with uh, the fishing sector, for example, to, to mitigate any impact there might be on their uh, sustainability? Um, I mean, I, I uh, am not directly involved in the liaison groups uh, with the fishery sector, but I do know that uh, the discussions are ongoing at several different levels. So, um, I mean, that starts up with the industry group. Um, we do par participate in, in again, uh, discussion forums with the sector on strategic planning. Um, they are, we, we are usually involved in the same groups as them when it comes to looking at the marine plan and uh, steering the work that, that goes into um, delivering new plans. Dropping down onto project level, um, each developer will have their own um, set of, of uh, discussions with the, the fisheries sectors, the, the commercial fisheries that are impacted or potentially impacted by the project. Um, so. Uh, there is a, a, a level of engagement across the board. Um, as uh, Charles and others uh, have already said, you know, this is about finding a balance in terms of uh, trying to, to deliver the offshore wind potential that is there um, with the minimum impact on other sectors and on the environment. Questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. And uh, essentially, my centre question is about the Crown Estate and money. Uh, so I think this is where uh, Annie Breeden may find herself uh, responding very largely uh, to, to this. Um, the, 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 the first uh, thing, given that you are described as a policy planning manager, uh, how do you determine 
uh, what your policies are in relation to fees and charges. So we have, um, we have a sort of different approach for different industries. Um, for renewables, we, um, we take into account the, the state of the technology. Is it a commercial scale? Is it test and demonstration scale? And what the market conditions are, what other pressures there are on the developers. So we're currently working this up for our planned offshore wind leasing round, which is due to launch later this year. Um, for other industries, we, um, we receive sort of external advice. We're looking to um, undertake um, a review of our sort of aquaculture operations in a lot of different respects over the next year or so. Um, and I believe one aspect of that that will be considered is rental income. I think at the moment, um, I can tell you that for salmon, we, um, we charge it £27.50 per, £27 per tonne um, of net gutted weight of fish produced. Um, and that, that's our price at the moment, and we're very open about what these, um, what these prices are. And over the next um, few years, we're going to be looking at how we do all of this, given um, our, new, our new legislation that we operate under. And I think for fish farming in some of the, in the Western Isles and for Orkney and Shetland, there's a 10% um, a discount of rates, given the, um, the increased cost of transport to market, et cetera, for um, operators in these areas. So we have a, a sort of a slightly different approach for different industries, um, which we consider is really sort of best value for us, but taking into account the market conditions that the industries are operating in. So the, the, I, I got the implication there that for sunrise industries, and I might uh, think in terms of tidal, which is mm. not yet um, even remotely at commercial scale, uh, you are prepared to, in effect, invest to support them because there's a prospect of a longer-term financial gain. And yes, that's, that's right, point. yes. Right, that, 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 that's fine. Now, given that uh, quite a substantial uh, amount of the income that Crown Estate Scotland derives comes from the marine environment, um, to what extent are you required by ministerial direction, by legislation or otherwise, to turn some of that uh, revenue there back into uh, investment in marine science and uh, restitution of the environment and so on and so forth? Uh, or is there no connection between uh, how you derive your income and how you have to spend it? I mean, we don't have a direct link in terms of we will pay a percentage of our um, revenue into research for different um, areas. We, we do invest in research and development. Um, I think for aquaculture, last year we invested um, just over £100,000 in research and development um, for offshore energy. Um, we input into different um, research programmes that are ongoing. We'll provide sort of ad hoc funding um, into specific Marine Scotland research projects. Um, and at the moment, we're in discussions with Marine Scotland about how much um, revenue we should be contributing to well, let research. Me, let me just pick on that. And is that decisions that uh, Crown Estate Scotland are making? Or are you being directed to do this? I'm not objecting to your mm. doing this and asking the question <laughs> I used to it. Um, I'll have to be completely honest and say I don't know exactly how those decisions are made. I'm sorry. Right. Well, yeah. I've also got a supplementary on this before I come back to you, Stuart. Mark? Um, it was slightly tangential, but I was going to ask you about whether the Crown Estate leasing can be used to effectively require a, a proportion of Scottish manufactured content when it comes to you know, offshore wind farms, for example. And, well, that's... Um that's a hot topic at the moment. Obviously, we're um, considering, at the moment, we're um, working with colleagues at Scottish Government and Marine Scotland to understand, um, we're going through a process looking at what different 
levers and mechanisms we might be able to incorporate into our leasing. Um, we've the process hasn't concluded yet. I think we've come up with a number of options, and we're um, getting legal advice on them as to what actually what we can do that's legal. So um, it's yes, we're we are looking at this at the moment, but um, we don't have an outcome yet. But we're looking at it to inform the new leasing that's coming later this year. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll go to Renewable Scotland and, and pose the uh, Scottish Renewables and pose the, 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 the question as to what extent um, you regard the Clown Estate Scotland as open and transparent and more fundamentally predictable given that your investments are relatively long term and how, how has that evolved and how would you want to see it evolve in future? Um, I think uh, it, it's, uh, I'm always wary of, of uh, putting words in the industry's mouth. Um, as far as I'm aware, it, it, is a, it is a very open and transparent relationship between our industry, the offshore wind sector, and Crown Estate as the landlords. Um, in the run-up to the new leasing rounds, there's been a very open dialogue about how that round should be uh, framed, how it should be conducted, um, and the elements of the process in terms of option agreements. Uh, all of that has been consulted upon openly with the industry. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, that's absolutely fine. There is no right answer <laughs> when I ask a question. There is genuinely a question uh, in it. And, and finally, perhaps back to Annie Braden, uh, just to, to what extent uh, should you be uh, investing in protecting in, and enhancing the marine environment? Because I think one of the, the messages we got out from the previous panel, and I think you were all sitting in to, to, to hear that, as far as I could see, um, that, that there is a need to do more in the marine environment. Primarily, we're being told through climate change, but through many other interventions. To what extent should Crown Estate Scotland be doing more than it's currently doing? Well, I think there, there is definitely the opportunity for us to do more. Um, as, I'm, as I referred to earlier, we, are, um, we do have a new act that we're operating under, which is, is very, very new and is still sort of being implemented. So I think um, for our organisation, we're still trying to work out in a way what, what we can do, what we should be doing in order to fulfil the obligations under that act. So I think... We are looking to do um, more than we have done in the past. We're looking to be sort of more proactive from a, a sort of delivering sustainable development perspective. You know, what, how we operate um, as the new organisation will be different as to how we operated under the last. So um, we're looking to understand what we can do in this sphere. OK, questions from Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks, um, convener. If I could turn to um, fiscal measures. Um, we know that the, the, the Seafish Industry Authority collects and disperses a UK-wide seafood levy. And clearly, in my view, there's a case for Scottish ministers to have the power to raise a, a, a Scottish seafood levy uh, and a full autonomy with regard to deciding how seafood levies are best utilised here in Scotland. Um, so how... Does the panel feel uh, with regard to the existing uh, UK-wide seafish levy operating in terms of supporting sustainable development uh, in, in the Scottish marine environment? And do you have a view on, on whether the seafood levy should be devolved? Linda Rosper? Um, yeah, I should declare an interest here in that I'm a member of the Seafish Board. Um, so I'm an independent member of the Seafish Board, um, appointed by all four ministers to that board. So um, I, um, I'm not here as a spokesperson for, for Seafish. Um, as you say, it's a UK-wide levy. Um, it's quite a political issue. There's been, um, it's been raised in the, in the House of Commons, I think, relatively recently. Um, by way of just factual background, if I can just add that one, one point, um, that the levy is, is um, levied on fish 
uh, landed into the UK and also to sort of process fish imported for processing. So um, there is a lot of levy that comes into um, the coffers that comes because of the processors in, in the northeast of, of, of England. Um, but in view of my role, I can't really say anything, and it is a very political issue. Um, I, I could say, if I, just to add on to what was talked about previously, um, in terms of um, resource, the Crown Estate revenues are probably the closest to like an environmental rent that we have in Scotland, because um, although Scotland doesn't have levy raising powers, um, the, the Crown Estate revenues, which are fully devolved, um, you're able to charge those on um, amount of fin fish grown, amount of electricity generated, and that I think gives um, you know an ability to to charge you know, sort of like an environmental rent, which I think is quite interesting in the context of the discussion that you're having earlier on. Okay, notwithstanding your position on the Sea Fish Board, uh, I think the committee would appreciate the view of the SWT. Um, so if you could sub arrange for that to be submitted, I will do uh, at some point. Sure. So um, I don't work directly on, on fisheries policy and, 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 and such like, um, but in terms of the levy, it, it's certainly back to that principle of kind of beneficiary pays principle where they're, they're um, accruing a benefit from, from the marine environment and, and rightly they should be contributing towards the, the cost of the management of, of that, of that uh, environment, which is borne by government and, and, and other, other sectors. Okay, so for the record, do you think it should be devolved? Uh, I wouldn't like to say. <laughs> okay, um, right, well, there's, uh, anyone else, sorry, uh, in the panel, no? Okay, th there have been proposals from the uh, Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust for a landings, a landings tax on, on fisheries in Scotland as a means of sustainable uh, cost recovery and investment in ecological sustainability. So would you have a view on uh, on that, uh, whether a landings tax should be introduced? Anyone? I, th I think, again, um, we would be supportive of, of, of such a, a mechanism to, that delivers funding towards management of the marine environment, the natural marine environment. Um, but yeah, in terms of specifics, I, I couldn't uh, offer any further detail. Okay, no one else. Yeah, it, it, it's unfortunate we don't have representatives from the sea fish industry here eh, today to, to, to ask these questions, um, although it's not through the lack of trying, I think. Um, are there any other fiscal measures that could be used in, in other marine industries to deliver more eh, for a, a marine environment that you've identified? Um, the Scottish Wildlife Trust has proposed um, looking at the area of decommissioning. This is an area that... Um, could be um, looked at um, in, in a way that might be helpful in generating some revenues. Um, it's quite a controversial topic. Um, it's a proposal that for some um, installations, rather than decommissioning by removing everything from the sea, that um, the um, sort of inert structures could, could remain and that there might be some environmental benefits from that rather than um, removing everything in, in, in entirety. It's still our view that, as our expectation is our, that, um, in general, um, the presumption should be that um, such structures are removed. But in some circumstances, and this would only be after you know, detailed env environmental examination, it may be to the overall benefit of the environment to leave the structures in situ where they've been providing uh, an environment and a little ecosystem for some time. And there's been some research at U University of Edinburgh that has looked at this. Um, we gave evidence on this to the Scottish Affairs um, Committee and um, it is, it's a controversial topic and the committee recommended that the regulator should sort of look at this in, in more detail. Okay, it'll be good to see how that develops. Charles? To say, I'm not sure um, the legislation allow it, it, it kind of supports or enables um, this kind of setting of conditions that would would require uh, funds to be, you know, attributed to a, a particular um, particular cause. I, th I mean, there there are conditions in current um, offshore wind farm 
licenses, which uh, ask for a contribution towards a regional advisory group activity. So the Murray Firth and, and the Firth of Forth both have these groups that have been established as part of the conditions of licensing. Um, and so they're, they're required to be an active participant in those, and, and, and they do deliver um, a level of research. But in terms of going back to the point about kind of articulating what, what, what could be done or, or what should be done, um, the conditions are quite broad in that respect, so that it's, it's, not, it's not specific um, as to what should be delivered or, or what must be delivered. Another that I thought of, um, in relation to where environmental harm is caused or environmental damage is, is caused, um, such as maybe escapes from fish farms or um, um, I mean other other spillages or or, or damage, um, ensuring that the polluter pays, ensuring that there is a way of recouping revenue that could then be used for environmental benefit, I think would be a, a good area to develop, and and we don't really have that fully in place at the moment. Okay, thanks. Um, and finally, just uh, one, one last question from me. Are, are there examples of other countries using levies or taxis uh, to, to fund marine enhancement that, that Scotland could learn from, that you're aware of? No? Okay. Um, I mean, we, we do have some information regarding uh, fisheries charges being used in Iceland, Australia, New Zealand and the US. You're, you're not aware of any of these? Specific um, rigs to reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. That was one where certainly there are payments to the sort of state authorities in relation to um, some activities there. Okay, it's, it's maybe something we can look at in the future. I should mention that um, an announcement also already alluded to the fact that we did invite representatives from fishing industry, um, many, and and they were not able to send representatives in this case. So. Um, move on to questions from John Scott. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm interested in this uh, concept of um, marine enhancement. Um, uh, going back to what Stuart Stevenson said earlier, essentially marine planning gain. I mean, planning gain is a well-established concept, building on land and developers. Um, I'm not certain that the renewables industry would necessarily welcome marine planning gain, but um, how well-developed is that as a concept? Um, Perhaps a question for Patricia Hawthorne and Anne Breeden. Um, I would say I'm, I'm not aware of it being developed as a concept beyond um, what we regard as a, a very constructive process of understanding the environment that we're about to place developments in and learning from that uh, all the way along the line. Um, I, I think... Um, the part that the offshore uh, renewables sector has played in, in delivering a lot of information about the marine environment has been viewed as, as a contribution uh, to that extent. But uh, in terms of um, specific proposals, I'm not aware of any. It's just the concept, if you're a developer building maybe 500 mm -hmm. houses, you ask to put in a, a new roundabout or build a road to it. Um, uh, everyone, uh, and land would have to de deliver an environmental impact assessment, which, of course, um, the offshore renewable industry will do too. But in terms of actually enhancing it, um, have you any views on it, uh, Annie Breeden? Um, I mean, I'm not aware of it really being considered at the moment, to be honest. Um, right. And it's, from our perspective, I mean, it's not something that we would ever seek to sort of incorporate into a lease or anything. We would. Um, we would wait to see what came out of a license or consent. So if you know there was a wish to do that, we could help to deliver it. But um, at present, I don't think it's anything that's mm. under discussion. OK, thank you. I'll move on to um, essentially um, public money for public goods. Um, down the theme of the discussion under a post-EU uh, agricultural funding has been the idea of public money for public goods. Is this a concept that's relevant to the marine environment? And if so, what would it mean in practice in terms of government support, public money for public goods? In the, in the, on, on land, you're, you're talking about um, farm payments. 
being used to purchase um, landscape, um, which people enjoy, and, and those sort of wider societal benefits. Um, I, I think I mean, the first thing is that the scale of the um, subsidy for farming is, is, is quite substantial. In comparison, the EMFF is much more modest as a fund and is much more limited in its purposes. It does not um, um, underpin day-to-day -day fishing in the way that the um, common agricultural policy underpins day-to-day -day farming. So I think there's a difference in um, sort of context there. Um, there is no so I'm, I'm sort of wrestling with the concept to see um, where that, that takes us then, with, with that as a given. Um, so the public money tend, I mean, in fact, the, the fund, the European fund went from European Fisheries Fund to Euro team, Euro, European um, sort of Maritime and Fisheries Fund, and the intention in that was to um, ensure that it wasn't focused purely on fisheries, but it did have a wider marine objective in, in, in the way in which the fund was administered. So I think that movement had already started to happen. Okay. Sorry, could I just take a step back on planning gain? I didn't manage to, um, to touch on that, but um, as far as I'm aware, there isn't really a mechanism, I think, uh, to, to deliver that in, in the marine environment, and it's certainly something that we would support um, through s securing um, funding to deliver w what's required. And I guess um, th the problem there is, th is the connection of the license that's being granted to the work that needs to be done, and they may not be in the same place um, for the marine environment. So, um, one of the, just as an example, we do we have been involved in island invasive species eradication for seabird colonies. Um, those are located up on the west, northwest coast and, and northern islands. So, um, they may not be applicable to a, to an activity down on the west coast, southwest coast, or, or east coast. So, um, but it's certainly something that we are having discussions with, um, certainly the renewable sector, as, as a means to, to deliver some positive benefit from, from the sector. OK, thank you. And do you see Brexit having an, an impact on Scotland's ability to fund and deliver enhancement in the marine environment, or not? So, go on, whoever. Yes. Uh, yes. Mr. Nathan. Yes. <laughs> I, th I think our main our main concern is is, is um, a kind of governance gap, so the, the potential weakening or, or loss of uh, environmental protections and the mechanisms to, to enforce those. Um, obviously, governments may have more uh, or greater discretion around that without the um, kind of U European Court of Justice. So, one of the although uh, we we really welcome um, Scottish ministers' commitments to meet or exceed the uh, existing environmental protections. And, um, and I guess one of the key uh, elements that we really would be looking for is actually delivery of an environmental watchdog, um, where, which would replace the kind of uh, position of the European Courts of Justice, effectively um, being able to enforce uh, environmental protection legislation. I mean, mm -hmm. much, very much agree with what Charles has said. Um, I mean, in addition, there's the risk of losing um, the, the sort of core money that comes um, for data and compliance from the European Commission. Um, that is a, um, you know, a chunk of money that, that helps to buy services for you know, shared data collection across Europe, uh, shared compliance across Europe. Um, you know, it's really, these are really important ways of ensuring that we're following best practice um, and those dedicated funding streams have been significant. I think the, the, the local funding as well, the, um, the way in which local, um, local people can bid for coastal element of um, the, the maritime funding, um, I think has been quite significant in people's relationship with the sea changing, and there's been quite a lot of exciting local projects in, um, in all sorts of um, small coastal communities that have been really significant. And often these things are, are the things that get lost when there's a time of change. Okay. 
Oh, thanks very much. And, and can I finally ask you, is it possible to restore the marine environment via project-by-project project approach, or is a more strategic approach required? I and mean, to what extent is Scotland's current approach to marine enhancement strategic or sufficient? So just, just in terms of... I guess I've touched on it already, but yes, definitely um, it, it can't be delivered, I would say, from a from a project-by-project project staged uh, delivery of, of, of enhancement um, in most cases. But I think we, we definitely do need more of a strategic approach, which really needs to be articulated in, in the National Marine Plan. I think taking it from where we've got to with all the policy framework in place now and the, the requirements for, for delivering enhancement, but actually articulating that and wh what is it? Is it protected, uh, well, I mean, it is protected areas, protecting blue carbon sources, biogenic reefs, as, as really, really looking at the, the kind of basic fundamental uh, support system within, within the, uh, in the environment that supports the, the species that we have. I very much agree, and we need to t translate high-level objectives, have our high-level objectives, and then work out what that actually means in terms of change management. Um, change priorities in funding um, and ensuring that we're, we have the sort of strategic grasp to, to make change that moves the environment in a positive way. Um, and I think that's the, ne the next big challenge for the next phase of marine planning. Uh, I'm, I'm not wishing to contradict you, but I'm, I'm surprised that you wouldn't have thought there was a value in a project by project approach, too. I mean, it's all very well to have a high level approach, but actually doing things and Achieving things usually will mean a project by project approach. High level aspirations of themselves are fine, but. I, I think you can often test things out at the project level. Sorry? I think often it's helpful to test things out at the project level and then apply them more widely, so from that basis. But I mean, I know, for example, in the Wildlife Trust, we have a number of projects um, in health, in education. Um, but it's only when that approach is applied nationally that you really get a big change. And I think in terms of marine, um, we're, we're at the stage of we're building up our evidence base, we're starting to understand what our real problems are. So to have that vision, um, which is bigger than just a, a small project, is, I think, the next step. <laughs> Thank you for putting me in my place. <laughs> um, a final question, and it is directed at Linda Rosper, because there are arguments from um, Scottish Wildlife Trust have made the argument it's an opportunity through oil and gas decommissioning to create a marine stewardship fund. And, and, and I guess it's a, a case of, you know, uh, oil and gas has reaped a lot of benefits from the marine environment, and now that they're coming up to the decommissioning stage, there is an opportunity there to uh, perhaps... Uh, Give a bit of payback. But is that something that you have a, a view yes. on? I mentioned this earlier that um, that was very much you know something that we've put forward as a as an idea um, a few years ago when we gave evidence on it recently to the Scottish Affairs Committee. It's it's a controversial notion because a number of environmental organisations believe very strongly that all the structures should be removed um, and there are arguments both ways. But some of the science says that there is a benefit in um, in some cases, in a small number of cases, in not removing mm. the structures and that therefore there would be some financial saving to the industry and that a substantial proportion of that saving could then be put to good environmental uses. Right. So that's the, the fundamental idea. Um, as I say, it's a, it's a fairly controversial idea, but there is research evidence behind it. Is it controversial because of the kind of... Um almost the, the kind of counterintuitiveness of leaving effectively litter in the seabed or is it controversial because the industry is not on board with the suggestion that you've made that they should be taking the saving that they're making from it's not... It's particularly controversial with environmental groups because of the history right, of the sort of of, whole brain of the spar sea. argument. Yeah. It would also be controversial with fishing interests who I think would expect to see the structures removed. Um, to free up those fishing grounds again. So uh -huh. it's controversial from a number of, of different places. Uh -huh. But the costs of decommissioning are very high. Yeah. Um, and so we're simply highlighting the fact that it is good to look at these issues. Um, it would have to be looked at extremely carefully that the risks are there. I know that there is concern that could you, could you trust enough to be sure that um, nothing noxious had been left inside? Is your sampling good enough? 
um, that there would be all these sorts of questions. Um, but um, so we've simply put it forward as an idea that this, this merits some consideration right, okay. and that there could be benefits. Charles Nathan? I, th I think certainly um, worth exploring uh, leaving structures in situ. Um, but in terms of the monies that, <laughs> that might be available, I think it's worth noting that they're, they're actually uh, subsidised to deliver the decommissioning. So it's not actually money that's sitting to one side currently. It's money to be spent in the future. So it's almost kind of non-existent in that context. So it, it depends on how, uh, what you decide to do. If there is a decision to uh, leave them in situ, then considering well, what, what monies might have been saved in, mm. in actually removing those facilities, that money then has to come from government UK taxpayers. Mm. But has uh, like decommissioning not been built into the sort of uh, the, the fact that when they actually were putting forward for licensing for yeah. developing those fields, yeah. that decommissioning had to be factored in as a cost as part of I suppose, a long term business plan? So that certainly there is a requirement for a kind of a decommissioning plan to be in place and mm. to be reviewed as you, as you progress through the age of the, the development. But some, certainly the earlier projects that were installed are of such a scale and, um, and size that decommissioning is, is you know, the, the technology doesn't exist to be able to remove some of these structures from the water. So there's a, what was delivered or in, installed pre-1990s, I think it was, um, and, and then subsequently from then till, till now. But in terms of the actual expenditure, I don't think, I, I don't know, I would, we'd have to ask an industry representative to yeah. detail to what, what costs have been, you know, foreseen in, in planning that decommission. But in terms of, any, I mean, my, 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 I guess my wider question about a marine stewardship fund, you know, is that something that, that the oil and gas, as they, as they make decisions around decommissioning, whether whatever they do, should be putting monies into um, a marine stewardship fund? I mean, is that something that... Certainly support it and worth exploring as, a, as, a, as an opportunity. Okay. Uh, final question from John Scott. Just about liability for such structures left on the seabed. To whom would that, um, wh whose liability would that be after 20 years, shall we say? So, there must be, uh, so or, or 50 years. Um, the, as I understand it, it's the company is, yeah. is liable in perpetuity. So be liable issues, in perpetuity. That would be one of the issues that would have to be um, Even if this was a government out. suggestion. I think I mentioned the Gulf of Mexico example, and there um, I think some monies change hands in order for liability to be accepted by another party, which I think is the, is the state government. Yeah. yeah, obviously there are risks to that in terms of they've got to plug a well and that plug has to be um, strong enough and robust enough to exist for 100, 200 years and who's going to go back to check it in, in you know, 50 years' time? Um, all those costs that are associated with it. So it's not a straightforward um, Is that something... Patricia Hawthorne might wish to comment on, being an industry representative. Is that a situation you're happy with, the um, li liability and perpetuity? Uh, certainly from a renewables perspective, I think all our decommissioning plans are predicated and priced on removal of kit, uh, although the point of having an environmental impact assessment at the time is to ensure that that is done in the best possible way, and if there's good reason for leaving something there, then that discussion can be had at the appropriate time. I think just maybe coming back to the point that you made previously about uh, building enhancement into that, uh, uh, one of the challenges in these projects is trying to anticipate what the decommissioning costs will be. Um, so, you know, that's the decommissioning cost that we, we know about in terms of, of taking the infrastructure away to try and build in something to do with enhancement, which we can't define 25 years before the event, could, be, could mean paying for something that isn't relevant at the end of the day. So I think we just need to be very careful about how we expand that uh, concept. But um, at the moment, it's, it's uh, as far as I'm aware, decommissioning is predicated on everything being removed. Okay. Okay. Right. I want to thank you all for your time this morning. Um, we are, that concludes our meeting today and our business in public. At its next meeting on the 18th of June, the committee will consider amendments to the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill at Stage 2 and will now move into private session and ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed.